The rule of law matters in all kinds of different ways. Uh, it's the foundation of what gives people the confidence to be able to speak their minds, for instance, knowing what the rules are in advance and they won't be punished by the government for what they say. Law really matters for, especially for economic development, for people to be secure in their property rights, know that their contracts are going to be enforced. And what we see when we look around the world today is that countries that have the rule of law tend to be richer and freer than countries that don't. The constitutional principle of the rule of law means that we live under known and settled laws that were established in a system that is open for all to see. Like many constitutional principles, many take this idea for granted. We know that our laws are stable and that the rules of the game cannot just suddenly change. As John Adams said in 1776, the true idea of a republic is an empire of laws and not of men. Rules cannot be discarded or laws enacted on one person's whim unless established legal processes are followed. One of the things that's most interesting about the rule of law is that, is that has emerged in history. It is primarily a protection for the ordinary person. The rich and powerful have always had the ability, in some sense, to be able to manipulate the government for their own ends or find the loopholes in the law to protect themselves and that sort of thing. It's the common person, the person who doesn't hire the lobbyist, who, uh, who doesn't have the ability to, uh, um, to influence the government, that benefits most when the government um, uh, protects the rule of law. A look back at the way the Constitution was framed and ratified shows how committed Americans were to the rule of law. After flaws in the Articles of Confederation were identified, 12 of the 13 states sent duly appointed delegates to a meeting in Philadelphia to revise the Articles. When that convention, now called the Constitutional Convention, completed the document, the Constitution then had to be ratified by the states. State ratification took place in conventions, where the people elected delegates to represent them. The debate was intense, but never did people resort to violence to force their views on others. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights themselves provide some ways to ensure the rule of law is followed. The Constitution forbids bills of attainder, or laws passed to single out one person. It also bans ex post facto laws, which means the government cannot suddenly declare an action illegal and then punish people who did it in the past. All criminal trials will be tried by a jury. The police cannot search you or your property without getting a warrant from a judge by showing probable cause. People accused of crimes have many rights to due process. The right to know what they are being charged with, to consult with a lawyer, to confront their accusers, call witnesses in their own defense, and have their trial take place in a speedy manner in the location where the alleged crime occurred. A government cannot try a defendant over and over until it gets a guilty verdict. Excessive fines and cruel and unusual punishments are also forbidden. The most serious crimes require a grand jury to bring charges, and the crime of treason can only be proven by the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. Why do we afford certain protections to defendants uh, in criminal cases? Uh, why do we afford certain protections for freedom of speech and freedom of press? Why are there restrictions on the ability of the government uh, to invade our private domains? Uh, all of these things have to do with the rule of law. All of these things have to do with living in a rights-oriented uh, republic. All of these things have to do with due process of law. Fundamental safeguards on freedom can only be suspended in specific cases. People accused of crimes tend to be disliked and even despised. A check on the power of the majority, which may want to set aside protections for due process in the name of revenge, is one purpose of the many safeguards for individual rights in the Constitution. The need to make sure that the guilty are punished, uh, the need to make sure that injured people get uh, compensation in a, uh, in a timely and in a fair way and are not frustrated by a legal system that uh, interferes with their rights or becomes too expensive or, or inaccessible. That's an important component of the, of the rule of law and I think it's important for us to recognize 
that unless we are responsive to the needs of the people and actually vindicating their rights, people will have feel these frustrations and these outlets. And like all constitutional principles, the rule of law depends less on its being written down somewhere in a legal document and more on citizens' commitment to it. Open crime, corruption in government, robbery, peaceful citizens' lives in danger, all stemming from a lack of respect for law. Is that what you want? Why, no. So we're all a lot better off respecting the law. Having a people that respected the rule of law for Madison would have been absolutely essential to having uh, a defensible uh, and secure republic. When laws are unjust, it means finding peaceful ways to persuade fellow citizens to repeal and replace them. A commitment to the rule of law means a belief in the duly established systems and processes, even if outcomes aren't what some expect. It means we may have to set aside our personal desires for revenge if we believe a guilty person has been set free. The people, through their elected representatives, always have the right to enact new laws if they believe changes are necessary. And when a government is repeatedly unjust, it may mean the right and duty to alter or abolish it. How transparent is our system of lawmaking? Our commitment to the rule of law sometimes raises questions. Should the U.S. enforce only those laws enacted by the people through their representatives? Does the U.S. have to enforce U.N. resolutions? International laws? Which laws exactly does the executive branch have the power to enforce? Does the president have to enforce all laws passed by Congress, even if he thinks they are unconstitutional? Can states nullify federal laws they conclude are unconstitutional? Will we live under the rule of law or the law of rulers? The idea is that there is a law or a set of laws that are outside and above the government. That, uh, that it constrains what the government is allowed to, to do to you. And so looking at the common law, looking at natural rights, and finally looking at the idea of a social contract theory, that the Constitution, again, is above and constrains the political uh, leaders. Those three bases all reinforce the idea of the rule of law. The idea that there are laws given by history, given by nature, given by the Constitution to constrain what our political leaders are allowed to do to us.